read over reading week. Uh, okay. That was even worse than pre-service prayer when Robin tried it, so <laughs> I should have learned my lesson. So we have been in the Gospel of Mark for some time um, now, but on long weekends we've been, we've been taking a break, just like a one-week break from that journey, that series, and we're going to spend a time, time in a psalm uh, on long weekends. And so today we're going to be looking at Psalm chapter 16. Um, if you're not super familiar with the book of Psalms, that's okay. It's in the Old Testament, the first half of the Bible, and, and it was originally written as a, as a prayer book. A prayer book for God's people as they were striving to live lives that were faithful to him. Teaching them how to pray, what does it mean to to live a life with God. And in Psalm 15, the one before what we're going to look at tonight, we kind of get this, this call to God's people to be faithful. To be faithful partners of him. To be faithful covenant people. And then in chapter 16, we kind of see this, this person, King David, and it's, it's King David's prayer, but he's, he's kind of being shown as, as an example of that faithfulness, as a model of that faithfulness. Psalm 16 is going to give us a beautiful picture of life with God. What does that look like? In other words, what does it mean to be fully alive in him? What does a life in relationship with God look like? So I'm going to read that, and then we'll pray, and we'll jump in. Psalm 16, if you want to follow along, we have it on the screens. Severin's got it up there for us. Let's give it up for Severin. He's the man. And that embarrassed him, so even better. Bonus. Psalm chapter 16, verse 1. David prays this. Protect me, God, for I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have nothing good besides you. As for your holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones. All my delight is in them. The sorrows of those who take another God for themselves will multiply. But I will not pour out their drink offerings of blood. I will not speak their names with my lips. Lord, you are my portion. And my cup of blessing, you hold my future. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I will bless the Lord who counsels me. Even at night when my thoughts trouble me. I always let the Lord guide me. Because he has my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, my whole being rejoices, my body also rests securely. For you will not abandon me to Sheol, you will not allow your faithful one to see decay. You reveal the path of life to me, in your presence is abundant joy, and at your right hand are eternal pleasures. Church, let's pray one more time as we open up God's word. Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that it is, it is you speaking to us today. Lord, as we get ready to, to open it up now, would you just have quiet hearts, quiet minds, and, and ears that are receptive to hear what it is you want to you wanna show us of yourself, God. We thank you that you are a God who has chosen to be knowable, that you want us to know you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to to see more of who you are in this beautiful prayer. Help us to know what it is to to be in a a relationship with you, God. Help us to see ourselves just a bit better today. I pray that as we do that, Lord, would you be glorified. Jesus, would your name be lifted up and honored as we do that. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. So I wonder if you've ever asked any of these four questions, or maybe all of them. Those four questions are this, will I have enough, will I be okay, will I be happy, and do I have a future? Have you ever asked any of those four questions? Maybe you're asking some of them tonight. Will I have enough, will I be okay, will I be happy, and do I have a future? 
just a few of the, the, the lighter questions of the human soul <laughs> that we often carry with us. But I, I actually believe God's word has something to say about how we can bring those questions and those longings to God and even see his faithfulness in them. David's going to kind of model how we can do that. And so we're going to look at Psalm 16 to do that. And if, if we had one word to sum up, to sum up Psalm 16, <laughs> you'd think I planned that, but I really didn't. <laughs> one word to sum up Psalm 16, it would be confident. David is confident in the Lord. He has tremendous confidence in his God. How confident are you in the Lord today? It's okay to be honest. I'm not going to actually ask you to, to say it. It's rhetorical. But it's okay to be honest with yourself. In fact, there are many, many books, many prayers in this book that don't sound all that positive. And yet God has ordained them to be in his word, to be in scripture. Why? He can take it. In fact, more than that, he wants your heart. He wants you. He wants to know your honest, vulnerable prayer. God himself said that David was a man after God's own heart. And David has many prayers in the book of Psalms that are more prayers of frustration, prayers of questions, prayers of even anger. But Psalm 16 isn't one of those. In fact, your Bible might even have a little subheading that says confidence in the Lord. Chapter 16 is like this explosion of praise and confidence from David. And what I want you to see before we get into those four questions, this is really important, that David's confidence in his God has nothing to do with his current circumstances. In fact, it seems to be in direct contrast to his circumstances. Now, we don't know exactly what was going on when David penned this particular prayer. But if you just look at verse 1, where he says, what does he say? Protect me, God, for I take refuge in you. We can venture that things weren't great. Normally, you don't pray, God, protect me, when you aren't afraid of something <laughs> coming after you. And we know, other parts of scripture and from history, that David spent quite a bit of time, more time than I have, running for his life. Literally freeing, fleeing for his life. He was betrayed by those that he called friends, even he called family at one point. David literally had enemies that were trying to take his life. There's a chance that he penned this prayer while on the run. But it had nothing to do with his circumstances, his confidence in God. This is important because we know, unfortunately, that we are really good. Like, the human heart is really good at allowing our current day, our current week, our current year to dictate and define who we believe God to be. Don't we? When things are going good, God is good. When things are going rough, God is cruel. God has abandoned us. God is the worst. And yet, what does Scripture say? God is unchanging. He is faithful. He is unwavering. He can't be good one day when things are great and then cruel the next. That's not our God. We have a tendency of allowing our circumstances to tell us who our God is. But what I want to invite you to do tonight, will you consider laying that down? And actually begin to see God and worship him for who he is, regardless of what's happening around you that given day or that given week. Whatever David was going through, and it didn't sound great, after verse 1, he explodes with praise and confidence in his God. Verse 2, you are my Lord, I have nothing good besides you. I am confident that you and you alone are enough. So what I want to unpack tonight is, like, where exactly did David see reasons for confidence in his God? Like, in what areas did, did David see that God cared and provided for him, and what does that tell us? Can we, too, have that same confidence in the Lord? So I want to suggest four things. I, I believe David saw God's intimate compassion, number one, for his physical needs. His physical needs. Answering the question of, will I have enough? Number two, for his thoughts. 
answering the question, will I be okay? Number three, his joy. Will I be happy? And finally, number four, his direction and future. Do I have a future? So number one, his physical needs. Will I have enough? Look at verse five with me again. David says this, Lord, you are my portion. You are my cup of blessing. This is beautiful and really powerful. In scripture, a person's cup typically referred to his or her condition in life, that which was given to them. Some might say, like, this is my cup to drink. This is my lot in life. In fact, in the Old Testament, when God set up the priesthood and he established the priests, he actually intentionally didn't provide them physical land because he said to the priests, I am to be your inheritance. I am to be your your portion in this life. And it's beautiful here. It's a very short sentence, but what David is expressing is a a confidence that actually went deeper than a belief, and this is important, deeper than a belief that God would just give him stuff, but actually a belief that God himself was enough to meet David's needs. David says, Lord, you are my portion. You are my cup of blessing." Think of it this way. Another way to translate it is your portion is your real wealth. And your cup is your real pleasure. What's David saying? He's saying, if, even if all my physical possessions were taken away, even if my inheritance was lost, I would still have joy because, Lord, you are my real wealth and you are my real pleasure. You are more than enough to meet my physical needs. Will I have enough? And David confidently said yes because of my God. The confidence we can know is that in the face of this longing question, will I have enough, is that we serve a God who is our, himself is our portion and our cup. But, but how do we know that? Because we know that the human heart is so prone to idols, right? We are so prone to grab on to things like material possessions, or self-image, or financial security, and and hold on to them so much that we actually start to worship them. So how can we actually come to a place where we say, "I, I don't actually need those things, but you, God, are my portion and my cup? How can we actually get there? I think really practically, two ways is gratitude and generosity. Gratitude and generosity. God, thank you for the things that you blessed me with that Brooke talked about earlier. Thank you for the things you've blessed me with, but God, my hope is not in them. My hope is in you. My hope is not in them. It's in you. I think this is actually in part what David is talking about in verse 4. When he talks about the, those who take another God, he's talking about idolatry, which quite simply is taking something that might be actually good but putting it in an improper place of value and worship. Sometimes taking that which might be good by itself, but making it God. And of course, the the idols that were being worshipped in David's time might be a bit different than in our time, but we still spend much time at the altar of of money, the altar of success, the altar of self-image, the altar of sex, pleasure. How can we be in a place where we say, no, Lord, you are my portion of my cup, gratitude. Jesus, I thank you for them, but my hope is in you. How do we actually release that grip? How do we actually cultivate that heart of gratitude? I really think generosity, radical generosity, is how we do that. Give thanks for what God has blessed you with, but start to seek his presence more than his provision of things. And start to actually give away that which you find yourself clinging to. Surrender to Christ that which you feel like I'm starting to worship and start to to give it away. Start to practice radical generosity. So So for some of you, it might be time. It might be time in your simple church as you're starting to get traction on your on your SME, your missional engagement. Maybe you're having a hard time 
feeling like, how do I fit that into my calendar? Maybe you need to actually start to give away that which you find most precious, your time. Intentionally release control and say, God, I'm going to sacrifice this so that you might actually be made known on my campus and in my community. And and while I give that away and see its power go away, I'm going to find my pleasure and my joy and my security in you. You, Lord, are my portion and my cup of blessing, not my time. For others, it might, be, it might mean giving away your, your, your knowledge, your world experience that has actually become a source of pride for you. And start to invest it into somebody else. Start to actually disciple somebody else. Start to give away that which you are finding security in. And I know for others, it will be money. And that's why it's such a beautiful invitation when Jesus says, to trust him with our finances, to actually practice tithing, giving a portion every time we receive income and blessing from him, saying, God, I see that it's not mine, it's from you, and so I'm going to give back a portion. I'm going to trust you with it. Lord, you are my portion and my cup. Church, as we cultivate gratitude and generosity, we're going to start to see our God provide in ways that we could not ever imagine before. And our confidence can start to grow. Lord, you are my real wealth. Lord, you are my real pleasure. David had a confidence in his God. Not just that he would give him the things he wanted, but that actually his God was enough to meet his needs. As he, as he asked the question, will I have enough? He had confidence in his Lord. Number two, David also had confidence in, in God in the way of his thoughts. As he asked the question, will I be okay? A common question that we ask. David had confidence in his God. Look at verse 7 and 8 again. He prays this, I will bless the Lord who counsels me. Even at night when my thoughts trouble me, I always let the Lord guide me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Have you ever noticed that typically, generally speaking, we don't wrestle with big life questions in the middle of the workday or the middle of a class. When do our minds go here the most? At night, when you're trying to sleep, because you said you're going to go to bed two hours earlier, and now it's one in the morning, and you have to get up at six. Like, why am I wrestling with, will I have enough? Will I be okay? What's the meaning of life? Why now? I had no problem sleeping at three o'clock in my lecture. I had no problem sleeping on the bus on the ride home. Why now? Why does it seem to be at night that our minds take over and there's this longing? Am I gonna be okay? This is important. Here, here's why I think why. David was actually speaking of more than just his like intellectual thoughts, his brain activity. There's a deeper longing and sometimes a deeper fear going on here. When David speaks of his thoughts, he's actually saying something more like, my mind and my soul. Lord, Lord, when my, when my mind and my soul, when my innermost parts trouble me. It's not just our thoughts that run wild. But often when the noise and the distractions of the day fade away, we can sometimes feel like we are alone. Am I going to be okay? It isn't just a matter of intellectual thinking, but it's actually a matter of the peace of my heart, the peace of my soul. David had confidence that he was not ever alone. Verse 8, I always let the Lord guide me. Another translation says, I always set the Lord before me. I see that he is here. Both day and night, in other words, he's saying, I've practiced realizing that the Lord's eye is upon me, that I am not actually alone in this moment. It's like he's saying, when I lie awake at night, I have come to see that my God will counsel my heart, my soul, and my mind even there. Church, can I remind us today that that our God is intimately present in the moments that your soul feels alone? Do you believe that that he can be not just a counselor to your thoughts, but actually, actually a counselor to your heart? 
that he, when you invite him in, can actually guide and direct your soul, your emotions, your desires. You see, often, again, there's exceptions to this, but, but generally speaking, all else considered, often our restlessness is stirred when we try to resolve our thoughts by ourselves and our own strength. But because of who our God is, we can actually confidently call on him to be our counselor and our guide. Lord, would you come in and help me settle my thoughts, actually help me settle my emotions tonight by bringing the peace of your presence to me. Direct me, God, in your goodness and your faithfulness. David said, I always let the Lord guide me, and because he's at my right hand, I will not be shaken. He knew a confidence in his thoughts as he asked the question, will I be okay? Number three, David saw a confidence, the fact that God cared about his joy. Will I be happy? This is another important one because I think for those of us who are here tonight, followers of Jesus, we know not only is life difficult, but following Jesus is also difficult, right? And so sometimes if we're not careful, we can kind of fall into the trap that's like, like, am I a bad Christian if I'm happy? <laughs> like following Jesus sometimes is so difficult that it's like, am I just going to have to know misery all the time? And of course, that could not be farther from the truth. Will I be happy is a very legitimate and okay question and okay desire. Sure, as people of faith, we believe that the end goal, the main purpose of our life is not, to, is not our own joy, our own satisfaction. But that's not to say that this life of following Jesus won't bring joy. In fact, I believe it will bring the greatest joy we'll ever know. And I can say that confidently. Because the life of following after Jesus is a life in pursuit of him and a life in his presence. And church, he is joy. He created joy. He isn't just joyful. He is the embodiment of joy. Sometimes I fear that we, we go through life thinking that the fruit of the Spirit is, is bitterness, chaos, frustration, and misery. But what does Scripture say the fruit of God's Spirit is? Love. Joy, peace, patience. In other words, the result of the Spirit of God working in your life is that it's going to produce love and joy and peace. Yes, this life is difficult. Yes, following Jesus is challenging. But it is okay to be joyful in it because our God produces joy in us. When I personally... I'm experiencing a prolonged, prolonged lack of joy. Not just like a bad day, but a prolonged lack of joy. To me, it's a good indication that I'm pushing back against Jesus being my Lord. You see, it's easy for the human heart to drift into the thinking that, that the way to joy is for me to be in control. The way for joy is for me to be my own God. But look at what David said his, confidence, his confident joy was coming from. Verse 11. He says, God, you reveal the path of life to me. You reveal the path of life to me. In your presence is abundant joy. At your right hand are eternal pleasures. Where is this confident joy coming from? It's coming from the presence of God and what David calls the path of life. In other words, he's saying it is actually truly living. It is actually joyful living to live under the authority of the one who created you. It is not actually joy to go out and try to live on your own, to be your own God, to be your own Lord. It's actually joy to live under the authority and under the lordship of Jesus. You see, church, the human heart was never designed to define right and wrong. It was never designed to demand worship of self. The human soul cannot bear the pressure of being its own God. And David reminds us that it's actually God himself who, when allowed to be the authority of our lives, leads us to the path of life. It's not a burden. It's life and life to the full. Abundant joy. Really practically, Simple Church leaders in particular, this is why we're continuing to encourage and ask you to lead your Simple Church family in being formed by God's word. It's really easy to gather and just talk about scripture. 
but we're asking you to do something different and better. And that's just not talk about scripture, but let it talk to you and actually be changed by it. We need the life that God's word brings. We need the correction. We need the direction, the discipline that only God's word brings. That's why we're asking you to lean in and say, let's just not gather and and talk in circles around God's word for an hour, but let's open it up, humble ourselves to Jesus as Lord and say, what do you have to say? What does this show me about my life? That's why we, we include on your simple church report, like how meaningful was your time in scripture? And we use metrics like, was there moments of application, confession, and repentance? Because that is what leads us to being formed by scripture. I was talking to someone recently who was like, why, why is the, the measure of a, an effective time in scripture so, so um, dreary and damning, the words they said. And it broke my heart because I think they're missing the, the joy and the life that comes from confessing, agreeing with God's word, and repenting and saying, I'm actually going to turn in the direction of Jesus. If only we knew the joy that came from seeing the truth of how God has called us to live and submitting to him as Lord. It could be pretty heavy and damning if we thought that we were our own God and we had to fix it. But when we actually put our heart into the hands of the God who made us and say, Jesus, I see your truth. Help me to live that way. Church, that is joy. That is the path of life. Can we continue to lean in as simple church families to being formed by God's word together? The path of life that Jesus has called us to. Will I be happy? Finally, number four, direction and future. Will, do I have a future? I know, I, I know that many in our church are asking this question right now. Where am I going? Do I have a future? Where am I going? Do I have a future? Now, to be fair, this can be a really self-centered question at times as well. For example, it can be, it can be framed quite selfishly to, am I going to make something of myself? And then sometimes when you're feeling like less than, you kind of just think, am I just going to make something? <laughs> and then sometimes the question is, am I going to make it? <laughs> Level one, am I going to make it? Am I going to make something? Am I going to make something of myself? The problem there is that then we can start to treat God like this really powerful way to get the future we want. But David's confidence in God was something altogether better. He saw his entire life as God's. He said, I have nothing good besides you, verse 2. You are my life. Look at verse 5. He says, he says to God, you hold my future. Lord, I am yours. My life is yours. You hold my life. You hold my future. In other words, David's confidence wasn't in some kind of strange promise that that God was going to make all of David's dreams come true. His confidence came from allowing God's dreams to be his. God, you hold my future. I have a direction because of you as you guide me, as you lead me. Church, what if, what if your confidence in having a future was actually grounded in you giving it away to God? You actually surrendering your life to Jesus and saying, my life is yours. My future is yours. I want my life, I want my vocation, I want my academics, my family, my skills to be used to see other people made fully alive in your hope. I want to have a confidence in my future by giving it away to the one who's made me and the one who's created me. What if confidence was actually found in surrender before God? I know because we've done these graduate brunch and learns and talking to a lot of you, I know many of you, especially if you're about to graduate, you're wrestling with classic next steps questions. Do I live in city A or B? Do I go to master's program A or B? Do I take job A or B? Some of you are just like, I would just love job A offer. But church, can I I remind you that that God has actually shown you which which path to take already. It's the one where he's magnified, made bigger in your life. And so while I understand that job A or B is an important question, but it's the second question. 
The first question is, is my heart postured to, to see Jesus glorified in either job A or B? Because if it's not, then it doesn't matter which job or which city. Am I willing, is my heart postured to allow Jesus to be glorified through my life? That's the first question. What if the answer you're longing for to the question of do I have a future is actually found in giving over the control of that answer to the one who made you? Saying, Jesus, it's yours. Lead me to what's next. And if I don't know exactly A or B, pick one. Disciple people and make sure Jesus is glorified in your life. Do I have a future? David had confidence because he said, my, my life is yours, God. You hold my future. Will I have enough? Will I be okay? Will I be happy? And do I have a future? All of those questions that we consider tonight are really pointing back to one. One ultimate question and one ultimate need. And that really is this. It's the need for God's presence. In other words, the big question underneath each of those four is quite simply this. God, are you here? And will you be here? We see it right from the beginning. Genesis chapter 2. We were created to walk with God. To know his intimate presence, to be made fully alive in him, and to live a life in relationship with him. In other words, David's confidence was grounded in this. He was supremely confident in God's presence. He knew his God was with him all the time. God seems, I heard someone commenting on this psalm and said, Man, David seems really confident that God was with him. God seems massively real to David. And maybe some of you are reading that going like, that's great for David. Like, I'm happy for you. I wish I had that too. And this is the question we need to land on, quite truthfully. Is that confidence for us as well? Or is it just that we read about and like, man, I guess David was just special. I guess David just happened to have a pen on a good day. Keep reading. He has bad days. But like, is this confidence for us as well? Or, or was like, was David somehow just more faithful? Was David somehow more worthy of the presence of God? Or can I actually take hold of the same confidence that he had? And, and the answer to was David more faithful is a very clear no. If you know the story of his life, you know he was exactly like you and I. David was not faithful enough just as none of us are. We can't be. Because to, see, to, to be in the presence of God in an intimate way, Scripture says, actually requires a holiness that we fall short of. All of us do. Sin excludes us from God's presence. So how in the world can we have confidence that God's presence is with us, knowing that we're not faithful enough to deserve it? And the ground for our confidence, the reason for our confidence is because there is one who was faithful and he did it for you. The beautiful thing about Psalm 16 is that David was speaking about himself, but he was also kind of speaking about the future. He was speaking about King David, but he was also speaking about another greater king to come. In fact, near the end, look at verse 10, David says this. He's speaking about his intimate situation, but he's also looking ahead. Verse 10 says this, you will not abandon me to Sheol, to hell. You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. David was inspired by God's spirit to speak about someone that he didn't know the name of yet, but we now know as Jesus. In fact, twice in the New Testament, two different occasions, Peter and Paul both used this psalm in sermons to illustrate that, that Jesus Christ was God's Messiah, that the, that the man that they killed on the cross was so much more than a man, but that he was buried and raised to new life after three days, and he is the greater David. He is the one, the true faithful one. He was the one who actually did not see decay. He was the one who was not abandoned to Sheol. You see, church, Jesus was the ultimate and the only holy and faithful one. And though he lived in perfect obedience to the Father, he died the death of a rebellious sinner for you and I. 
Jesus experienced the distancing from the Father so that we could be drawn near like David was. You might have noticed earlier in the psalm, David boasts of this. He said, I have a beautiful inheritance. He's talking like a son. I have an inheritance. Well, the Bible says that Jesus gave up his inheritance as a son and came to live as a slave. Just like David declared, Lord, you are my portion and my cup, Jesus not only declared that, but he actually lived it out perfectly. On the night before he was crucified, Jesus was praying in the garden, and he actually prayed these words, Father, take this cup, suffering from me. Yet not what I will, but your will be done. Do you know what Jesus was doing in that moment? He was saying, Father, you are my portion and my cup. And if that means I take this particular cup of suffering and death, I will do that because you are enough to meet my needs. Jesus gave up the protection of the Father's right hand. And he experienced the darkness of Sheol and the process. Church, can you see it? The blessings of life that David talked about came because Jesus took the death that he deserved, that you and I deserved. And when he did that, he opened up a way into God's presence, not just for one king, for one man, not just for one nation, but for all, for whosoever may come to him in faith. David's confidence is in the Lord is your confidence too because of the faithfulness of Jesus and his death in your place. He's made a way for you as you are to come in relationship with him. When you surrender your life before him and say, Jesus, my life is yours. I see that you became sin for me that I might be called the righteousness of God. Will you be here, God? God, will you be here? Church, the cross has spoken and the empty tomb confirms it. We have enough in him. We will be okay because of him. We will be joyful in his arms and we have a future in his name. Let's pray.